Hi there, welcome back. Any of you who've been following my channel for some time will probably have noticed that I'm a particular fan of Braun radios. I have done two. One is the Atelier 3, which is the one with the record player. And the other one was the more recent SK22, which is a small FM AM tube radio. The one that I've always wanted to get my hands on is the one that's actually facing us right now. This thing is amazing. It's finally happened, but not quite. It's not mine. This is just someone who asked me to repair it. Somebody contacted me, said they heard that I repaired radios and could they bring one for me to look at? And I said, yeah, okay, fine. And the last thing I expected was for this thing to be staring at me when he opened the boot of his car. I'm really excited about this. <laughs> this thing is amazing. This thing is a Dieter Rams design. It's from around 1968 onwards. It's the Brown T1000 CD and it is the bee's knees of transistor radios. It's very sought after. It's become a collector's item and they go for a hell of a price if you can get them. The owner bought this when he was about 19, brand new. So this is not something that uh, he bought on the second-hand market. He's actually owned this all along. And for the time that he's had it, the age of this thing, the condition is excellent. There are a few things to look at, but it is generally in a very, very good condition. The problem is that it doesn't work at all, which is a shame. But if it did work, I wouldn't be messing with it. So I guess uh, everything happens for a reason. Let's have a closer look. The attention to detail on this is exceptional. For example, to remove this, you just open it, push it to the left. It's got a little spring on the left there, and it's out. This is AM tuning, FM tuning, and we'll have a closer look at those right now. So what we have here first is the FM AM selector, and also phono or tape input. So you choose what input you want. You then have a button here that says AFC and ferrite antenna. Now what this does is it has separate uh, functions depending on whether you're using FM or AM. On FM, you activate it and it'll activate AFC, which is automatic frequency control. And that sort of helps stabilize the frequency so there's no deviation. If it's on AM, then it activates the internal ferrite antenna as opposed to the, the uh, telescopic or the external antennas. Then if we go down here, we've got the antenna sockets, external antenna sockets. This is antenna ground and uh, AM antenna, long wire or something similar with your respective ground. This would be an external FM dipole over here. There's also a, a antenna tuning here, which is re really quite unusual. If you have an external antenna, then you can tune it for the specific band you're listening to. And the way you normally would do it is you'd set it to the band you want to listen to and you would tune the antenna till you get the greatest noise, which means that it's most sensitive at that point. And then you know that your antenna is optimally tuned or as optimally tuned as it can be for that particular band. Phonotape input, it's a DIN input. There's headphones out and speaker out. Now these two are, well, they're identical sockets, DIN sockets, so you could confuse them. I'm not sure if there's any difference on the output levels but we'll see that later. This is your on-off switch, power on-off switch. There's line and battery selector. So depending on what you're running it off, you either select battery or line. You have broad or sharp tuning. Now this is particularly useful for uh, AM a reception where you select the bandwidth of the tuning that you wanna use. If you want a uh, better hi-fi, better sound quality, and you're not too worried about the selectivity, then you make it broad. And what that does is it gives you a plus minus three kilohertz a width of tuning a band. If you make it sharp, it's plus minus one kilohertz. Now, what this means is if you're listening to part of the band that doesn't have many stations, you can put it on broad and it does improve the sound quality of, of the reception, especially the bass frequencies. If you're in a section of the shortwave band that has a lot of stations right adjacent to each other, then you put it on sharp and it narrows the tuning range to plus minus one kilohertz, which makes it a lot more selective. This here is the dial light is up and battery 
down so you can check this is a momentary push so you can check the level of the battery that indicator here gives you either a battery level uh, reading if it's just in the off position it'll give you the strength of the signal that you're receiving now this is important especially when you're doing direction finding if you have the direction finding adapter which we're not going to go into there because this one doesn't come with that now here we have the normal controls volume normal nothing unusual it does have a pullout and I am not sure what that means I am not sure what that pullout does I don't I know the tone control has a pullout as well and what it means is the one position gives you tone control bass and treble for music and the other position actually that's when it's down when you pull it up it gives you tone control for voice and it's indicated on here as well BFO is a beat frequency oscillator which allows you to decode uh, single sideband amateur radio transmissions which don't have a carrier what the BFO does is it basically creates an artificial carrier so it allows the radio to detect or pick up uh, single sideband uh, communications MGC is uh, manual gain control so it takes out the AGC which is the automatic gain control which it has built in and basically what that does is it tries to keep the level of audio equal depending on whether you've got a strong station or a weak station when you're doing beacon detection for navigational purposes you want to be able to actually determine how strong the signal is compared to another one another beacon so you would use the manual gain control as opposed to auto gain control band spread quite easy when you're in a particularly compacted part of the band lots of stations you tune approximately to where you want to be and you can fine tune it on here it gives you I'm not sure how much but probably a few kilohertz left and right of where you are so that's basically the controls now let's look at the dial itself this radio can tune right across the AM bands aside from the FM it goes all the way from 130 kilohertz on what they call long wave 2 all the way to 30 megahertz on short wave 1 in other words you can tune right across from that frequency without any gap in between and the way they do it is they break it down into 12 different bands this also helps to spread the band so you can tune more accurately anyway and when you get to a short wave you've also got the band spread down here but what this does is it allows you a huge range of tuning because you can actually select a particular frequency and you've got a very wide band over there that you can tune over for example long wave is divided into two different bands broadcast band has got two and one and then there are eight short wave bands and the way this operates is you've got a drum type tuning system selection system which is on the side here and it rolls a drum inside with a particular tune circuits for that band so it's better than a switch because you don't have the problem of trying to switch in a whole lot of uh, different contacts the drum actually moves depending on what band you choose and it indicates you here what band you're on broadcast one broadcast two long wave one long wave two and so on so it's actually a very very good way of bringing in the tune circuits that you need for that particular band and that particular band alone because the way most of the radio works is it's all very uniform once you get past the front end but the front end where you're actually tuning to a particular frequency and its respective oscillator that is where the differences come in between the bands and that's why you have a very distinct separation between those bands with that drum tuning mechanism I like it I like it a lot then of course you've got FM at the bottom here and the tuning there is with that bottom uh, tuning uh, dial the top one obviously operates all the AM bands this thing has actually got a few marks here and there but nothing dramatic and you've got some age related marks that's obvious but if this thing didn't have that then well it would probably be fake here we've got the band switch for the um, AM bands and as you can see 
you can hear it, it actually rotates a whole drum in there, which slides certain circuits into place, but we'll see that when we open it up. Again, a few scruff marks over there, nothing dramatic. A uh, little ding on that corner there. Now the back unfortunately has, uh, has been worked on. Somebody messed this up a little bit. I believe these things actually came with an option of not having the main socket. You, this thing operates from a, a battery. But um, some surgery has happened over here. They put in a DC jack to provide uh, 12 volts. The antennas are, are fine. I'm not sure that that one's original, but those two seem to be. Very little damage on this. So what I'm going to do now is just open it up and um, see what we've got inside. You just do that and the back comes away. Okay, yeah, well, that's not good. Everything is uh, disconnected over here. The other thing I've noticed is they actually describe to you how to remove the back, uh, the chassis. Pull the knobs off the potentiometers, undo the screws. It actually tells you exactly how to remove the chassis. That will definitely be helpful when we remove that from the cabinet. Let's look at the back for a while. We have a bit of a mess here. We've got the connections coming out of the battery. Now there are two sets of batteries. These are eight 1.5 volt cells over there, which provides 12 volts. And there's a 1.5 volt cell over here, which I believe is for the illumination. And they are connected together by the positives. So the positive is common. And I believe the negatives are then separated. And what you do here is, if you're using the 12 volts, yeah, you, you'd keep the battery in there. If you use a 12 volt uh, supply, the plug here, this, the uh, jack socket, would cut off the battery supply and take the power from the external supply. And that would then send it off to here. And this is the common negative, which is looking a bit ratty and it seems to be almost falling apart from that solder joint. Then it goes somewhere and I believe, I believe it goes here. We've got three connectors on here, one there, one there, one there. That one there actually says negative, positive and nothing on there. I believe that's negative as well. So that would be the common positive and then one of these is minus 12, one of these is minus 1.5. I'll have to check which way around it is. But what I can see here is this thing has been, looks like this board has been messed on quite a bit. A lot of solder joints that are really not original. There's some, some wiring at the back there that's been badly soldered. In fact, it doesn't look like it's been soldered at all there. I'm not too worried about the flux, that's normal. But certainly someone's worked on this board. And I believe, oof, look at that. Seems to be some strange solder blobs everywhere. So another one here, that could be simply to correct a broken track, but it's, it's iffy. Looks like that definitely will have to be looked at carefully. So that's been messed on the rest. Well, let's have a look. We've got that drum up top here, which is the um, band selector for the AM. And when you rotate that Control on the side there, it rotates the drum. Ferrite antenna, quite a big one at the top here, which you would select with that switch inside. Uh, I think this is probably, yeah, this would be the FM front end, encased to shield it from noise. Two antennas over here. 
IF stages over there with the respective IF transformers. Pretty interesting. It's actually quite neat and clean. Now we can actually remove the entire chassis and it also provides us those instructions on just how to do that. So I'm going to follow those instructions. One thing we have is this whole thing, because the batteries are disconnected, this whole thing can be put aside and we left just with a radio. Onwards. I'm going to go into a bit of detail as to how to dismantle this because I found nothing on the web and it might help somebody else. First thing you do, remove the front plate as I've done. It's just got that spring connector on there. You push it left, pull it out. You've seen that. Then you remove all the knobs. These just slide out. There's a couple here that actually have screws on. So you undo the screws and pull them out. This one here actually had lost the screw, so it just came out. Everything else stays the same. The tuning knobs also have screws on them. You just undo them and pull them out. And that's all you do on this side. Now you lay it on its front. Make sure you've got a padded surface so you don't scratch it. And you have to remove that side selector. And all you do there is you move these antennas up. In other words, you open them and you'll have access to the screw on the side of the selector there. You unscrew that and pull that out. The next stage is to actually get the antennas out of the way, and this is pretty clever. They've got a, an antenna holder. This whole bracket holds the antenna, and you've got two screws, one here and one here. So all you do is you loosen them, which means you can now first of all close the antennas, and you can actually pull this whole assembly down. Now when somebody did that, they actually broke a wire off here. This wire is just floating in the air there. We'll have to find out where that's supposed to go. So you've got to be very, very careful. This one also has sliding brackets. You undo those two screws, just loosen them, and you can move the antenna down. Then you've got four screws to bring the chassis out, and there are four screws in the corner they tell you that they're painted red, and they obviously were sometime. One there, one down there, there's one here, and the other one is down at the bottom there. Now, when I pull all this down, I should be able to just lift the radio out of the chassis. Let's have a look. There we go. Brilliant. Now I've just got to remove the speakers at the bottom there, and we're set to go. This is what we're left with. The entire chassis with a speaker in there, quite a hefty speaker. Everything seems to be in order. And we have the chassis which we can now look at and work on. When I uh, had a look at this, I noticed a few things and um, to get a bit further, I had to remove or loosen this panel. Now that's very simple. Four screws. One there, one there, one there, one there. And this thing lifts. Now I can pull it out, but I just want to show you something. This is what uh, attracted my attention. <sighs> Unfortunately, I think there's been a bit of a hack job on here. That plate over there, that plate there, is a shield and it was obviously soldered to this chassis point over here. Now it's just floating there and worse than that it's probably connected to ground or maybe this is what makes the ground but it, it was flapping and touching those points which is never a good thing. The other thing is this uh, resistor here is touching the chassis. So if that resistor, if that point there is not supposed to be ground, it certainly becomes ground when it touches the chassis. So this thing has been messed around with quite badly. Other thing I notice is that there's a wire just floating here. 
I have no idea where that came from. And the speaker wire, speaker out, is soldered to here. And also, not a very good job. And there are a few more things that become obvious. Um, that wire there, let's see if we can get some light on it. It actually looks like it's been burnt and left there. The other thing is this wire, this red and black speaker wire, Oh man, it looks like it was put in, it's not original, I don't think this is original. And not only that, they put it in and then somebody went and bloody burnt part of it over there with a the soldering iron. What else can we see here? So in summary, somebody did a bit of a hack job on here, on this section of the board. And it really, actually it pisses me off because there's no need for that. I mean, you when you work with something like this, there's a big difference between working, there's another solder burn, that can happen, but this one is unforgivable. Anyway, when you work on something like this, you, you've got to sort of be aware of what you're doing. You're dealing with a what is effectively an antique and I've seen this before. Um, I've actually seen some amazing stuff done to incredible radios simply because someone didn't take the care that the equipment deserved. And if we look at here, we've got the, this looks like the output transformer. This, uh, this radio has got a, an, it's a push pull and it uses an output transformer. But if we start looking down here, someone's been in here. Now, I don't know if there's anything wrong there. That capacitor there seems to have been changed. There's some strange botched soldering on there. I'll have to remove that board and look at it. But I think, oh God. Well, I, you know, judging from what's on the underside, on the back end, on the track end of this board, I'm not surprised that there's been some work done on this one. And I'm just worried as to what I'm going to find in here. I might have to, I won't say, re yeah, I might have to rebuild this board because it does seem to be a bit of a mess. So it's not surprising that no audio is coming out because I, I really pray that he hasn't or whoever messed with this didn't mess with this board because this is where all the, the RF is done. Those are the IF cans over there. And that can be really, really dramatic. But I think, according to what the owner said to me, the problem here was uh, audio. My guess would have been originally that this thing just burnt out a couple of the output transistors, which shouldn't have been too much of a problem. But now, the biggest problem is to redo what has been undone. And this thing really deserves it. So I'm not going to actually flip this yet because one of the things you one thing you got to be aware of is every time you open one of these, if you're not careful, you do more damage than you do repair. So you go in to fix something. If you're not careful as to how you actually take this out, you know, you start doing stupid things like having resistors touch the, the chassis and short circuiting there. And that causes another problem later on. So you've got to do it very meticulously and and i understand the problem i understand that a tech who gets this thing has never seen this before reading the whole schematic and reading the whole service manual is a it's quite a job unless it's a hobby and then you do it for fun and then it's actually quite interesting but a guy who's trying to earn a living fixing radios doesn't have the time to do that so he'll go look for the obvious stuff and he will fix it sometimes in the most obvious way like um well, like this, connect a new speaker wire somewhere where you get the signal. Maybe it's not where it's supposed to be, but unfortunately, this sort of equipment cannot be repaired like that. It's got to be done in a much more meticulous way. And unless you do these things every week, you know, where you have the whole build up the whole schematic in your head already, you've got to study up on what you're looking at first. You've got to read the manual. You've got to look at forums. You've got to listen to what other people have gone through and 
try and learn from them because somebody else has gone through this and made mistakes. And if you can avoid mistakes that somebody else has made, well, that's, that's a bonus. But if you're doing this as a job, you can't afford the time, which is why I do it as a hobby. And I really am a little bit saddened by the fact that whoever came in here did not give this the respect that it merited. But it's nothing that can't be undone because we've got the full schematics and all the information. It's just going to be quite a bit more work than I counted on. So I'm going to keep looking at this and try and get an idea, a clear idea of what it is that this thing needs. And we'll see where this goes. You remember how I said earlier that I was a little pissed off with what they'd done on the underside of the board? Well, that was nothing. That was nothing compared to how I felt when I started working on this guy, just to get it out. As you can see, I've removed the wires from that end there. They're all there, they're all labeled. But that labeling is worth absolutely bugger all because these wires were wired in here completely incorrectly. I think there were two that were in the correct location. The others that have to do the power supply were crossed over. So somebody probably decided they couldn't do anything with this and put it all back and just, well, let's just solder it any old way. Hey, guy won't know, will he? Well, I do know and I don't know what the result was if this thing was switched on after that because obviously the power supply is the most important part you're going to put onto a board. He's replaced capacitors, I can see that. Well, I won't comment on the neatness or lack of it of the job, but if you look at what all the markings on the board, there's paint on the board. I don't know what the hell the person was thinking. I don't understand how someone can do this and consider it a repair. Bloody hell. Anyway, I'm going to take those guys out. As you can see, <laughs> not the neatest of jobs there, but I'm going to take it out. I'm going to get cracking on this board probably rebuild it. I believe this board can be tested out of here because it's just the amplifier and some uh, voltage. Yeah, I think it's actually just the power amplifier. So I'm going to get it completely out of here, recheck everything, probably, well, rebuild, clean up the underside. It's a total mess. And when I get that done, I'll get back to you. And perhaps we can even test this board outside the radio because I think we can simulate the inputs here and um, and power it up directly. So the first priority is getting the power amp board, the AF board working, and then we'll take it from there. And then of course, to find the correct connections, I'll have to follow the schematic and correct whatever has been badly fitted on here. And I really, really, really pray that it's only on the power supply and power amp board and, and that front switching and not on the RF section because that can be a nightmare. Anyway, I'll uh, stop the video for now. I've got some work to do. I'll report back when I've got that done. And hopefully we'll be seeing something a lot neater than this. And um, I hope you enjoyed this video. I uh, look forward to continuing the series. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, share, like, uh, click the bell icon on the subscribe thing so you can be reminded when new videos come up. And if you do want to support the channel, uh, you can do so on Patreon. The link is at the end of the video. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.